there's a good chance you never even glance at your McDonald's receipt after the cashier hands it to you, but you should still ask for one every single time you place an order, according to one McDonald's employee. Cameron Adnan, a Cora poster who claimed to have been employed by the Golden Arches in London for over a year, said asking for a receipt is a surefire way to alert your cashier that you may be a secret shopper, therefore ensuring you're treated like royalty for the entirety of your visit. He said, It is easy to spot a gap buster because they always ask for a receipt, adding that secret shoppers usually ask for proof of payment so they can be reimbursed for their meal by their employers. Considering most customers aren't concerned with documenting their Big Mac purchases, it does make sense. According to Adnan, it works especially well if you visit the restaurant during peak hours. He explained, Basically, between 12 and 2 and 5 p.m. and 7 p.m., workers have to be extra careful because that is when gap busters, mystery shoppers, who are paid, visit McDonald's restaurants and rate their experience. This then goes to the overall store rating, and every store manager will do everything to ensure this rating is as positive as possible. That's pretty helpful information, especially since those are also the times you can usually count on the longest wait for your food, and sometimes the sloppiest sandwich. So what exactly do you get when McDonald's employees think you're working undercover? According to Adnan, you'll get fresh food, hot fries, and priority over other customers. That's one way to make sure you get the most out of your lunch hour, even if doing it makes you feel like a Hamburglar. The Hamburglar is very clever and very sneaky. There are a lot of foods at McDonald's that get a bad rap. It is fast food, after all. The chicken nuggets have long been under fire for their questionable ingredients, and they've somehow managed to squeeze 19 ingredients into something as simple as french fries. But every restaurant has to have at least a few safe menu options, right? One item that has long been touted as a smart choice is the filet of fish but some Reddit posters claiming to be ex-McDonald's workers are doing their best to blow that option out of the water. An insanely popular Reddit post asking fast food workers what customers should never order has garnered nearly 16,000 responses. And a large chunk of those responses have been dedicated to the beloved fish option from the Golden Arches. But the problem with the filet of fish isn't what you might think. It's not that the always perfectly square patty is an actual fish, it is. McDonald's uses wild-caught Alaska Pollock from certified sustainable fisheries. Sounds great, right? So what's the problem? Give me back that filet of fish! Give me that fish! Turns out that wild-caught fish still might not be fresh. At all. In fact, it could have been sitting around for hours before you take that first bite. One user said, no one orders filet of fish so at my store, they sat in the cabinet forever. Another person called it the fast food equivalent of playing Russian roulette. Of course, you can always request to have yours made fresh, as many posters recommended, but even that isn't always a sure solution. Many posters claim a fresh patty is just one that's fresh out of the microwave, after having sat for a long time in the warmer. And even if you really are getting a fresh-cooked patty, that filet of fish may still be completely questionable, as one Reddit poster who claimed to be an eight-year veteran of McDonald's unveiled even more dirt on this seafood favorite. The patties had a tendency to hang around well past their use-by timer. Similarly, the tartar sauce could go through several days sitting out in basically room-temperature conditions. Ew, not enough to turn you off? No worries, he kept going, claiming the fryer oil for the fish fillets was rarely cleaned. He finished up with, Don't get steamed buns, no one ever cleans the steamer. Despite all this, some loyal filet of fish fans won't be swayed. As somebody who regularly orders it, I have to disagree. It's by far the best fish sandwich that any fast food place has. According to McDonald's, the sandwich is still a popular seller both in the US and other countries around the world. Something tells us that won't change anytime soon. McDonald's has certainly changed quite a bit since its humble California beginnings in the 1950s, and a great deal of that change has happened just in the last decade or so. They've removed many of their playgrounds, spent $6 billion on making their restaurants more high-tech and sleeker-looking, and done everything under the sun to create a menu that appeals to fast, casual, loving millennials. One of the more nostalgic aspects of McDonald's that's faded away has been the burger chain's long-standing clown mascot, Ronald McDonald. The absence of Ronald McDonald is bound to split people into two groups. There are those who will view Ronald's firing from the McDonald's of today as yet another piece of their childhood gone forever. On the opposite side of the coin are those with more of a good riddance attitude about it. 
So why, after so many years of promoting Happy Meals, did the Golden Arches finally pull Ronald McDonald from its promotions? Despite the friendly and fun good nature of Ronald McDonald, 2016 brought some bad press to clowns everywhere that not even the almighty machine of McDonald's wanted to try and fix. Perhaps you remember back in 2016 when there was a rash of really spooky clown sightings across the United States? A clown just chased my daughter. Clowns were reportedly chasing motorists with knives, lurking around schools, and otherwise just being real creeps. This wasn't simply something that was causing a stir on the internet bulletin boards or Twitter. Major media outlets were reporting on rumors of terrorizing clowns. The whole thing was widespread enough that McDonald's felt the need to officially distance themselves from the worrying news. Spokeswoman Terry Hickey said in a 2016 press statement, McDonald's and franchisees in the local markets are mindful of the current climate around clown sightings in communities and as such are being thoughtful in respect to Ronald McDonald's participation in community events for the time being. While the creepy clown craze might have been the straw that broke the camel's back, it was hardly the only reason McDonald's parted ways with their clown. McDonald's hamburgers? Yeah! And some french fries? Yeah! Ronald McDonald has been McDonald's main mascot since the 1960s, but his presence was wearing thin before those terrifying clown sightings of 2016. Various watchdog groups had been criticizing Ronald's marketing of unhealthy fast food to impressionable kids for years, drawing comparisons to the long-retired cigarette mascot Joe Camel. Long before the creepy clown incidents, former CEO Don Thompson attempted to defend Ronald as a mascot, saying in 2014, you don't see Ronald McDonald in schools. You don't see him eating food. Basically, the message seemed to be that Ronald doesn't eat McDonald's food. He just sells it. Many observers thought the defense didn't do much to help Ronald as a mascot or McDonald's as a place to eat. That same year, the company redesigned the clown with a cooler, more sophisticated look. But whatever they were shooting for, the rollout was a flop. McDonald's has been going through a makeover to make its restaurants more appealing to adults for years. The company started this makeover in 2012, and they're still in the process of updating its 5,000-plus locations. This means self-order kiosks, refreshed exteriors, and dining rooms that take inspiration from cafes and coffee shops. But the turn away from the kid-friendly burger joint design is a problem for Ronald, whose loudly dressed cardboard cutouts don't really fit in with the new modernized aesthetic. McDonald's could always bring Ronald McDonald back whenever it likes, but these days, if you look through the company's social media accounts, you'll see that they're almost totally Ronald-free. This doesn't mean that Ronald McDonald has been 100% erased from the brand. You can still see Ronald McDonald representing the Golden Arches at least one day out of the year in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. McDonald's has been flying a giant Ronald McDonald balloon in the parade for years, and it continued to do so at the parade in 2019. Ronald's parade appearance that year wasn't exactly smooth sailing, though. Poor Ronald suffered a gash in his leg after being blown into a tree branch. The deflation got so bad that NBC cut away to pre-recorded footage from an old parade to save Ronald the embarrassment. You know you're not gonna get a gourmet meal when you pull up to the Golden Arches, but you do expect it to meet certain standards, right? Well, it might be time to lower your expectations. These are the most cringeworthy things you need to know before you eat at McDonald's again. Mint. Wow. I had a shamrock shake. I hate you. And I got one for you, too. I love you. We are under no circumstances telling you not to enjoy your annual shamrock shake. But we do want you to know why they're just called shakes and not milkshakes. Snope says there's been a rumor going around that the desserts can't be called milkshakes because they don't contain dairy products. But that's not true. They definitely use milk in those shakes. They just don't make them with ice cream. Instead, they combine reduced fat soft serve, which may or may not be allowed to be called ice cream depending on your state, with flavored syrup along with whipped cream. It's designed that way to not just be fast, but also consistent across all McDonald's. So while you're not getting something that's quite as gross as you might think, you're not getting any real ice cream either. This little nasty tidbit comes to us via Reddit on a thread asking, Fast food workers of Reddit, what should we not order at your restaurant? Why not? One user named Environmeth had all sorts of thoughts on just why you should think twice about picking up a McCafe beverage 
saying that in their experience as an employee, the machines are rarely cleaned. Hey Jack, that was a really good flat white. Thanks mate. Did you do something different? Mm -hmm. They also say the machines are horrendously complicated, so much so that they require specialized servicing and training to take them apart and really get all the gunk out of the nooks and crannies. But another employee chimed in to say their McDonald's managers went above and beyond to clean the McCafe machines, adding that it took an average of 30 to 45 minutes every day to keep them spick and span. So buyer beware, sounds like your cup of joe may come with room for a little… extra. You've heard the horror stories about how those oddly textured chicken McNuggets are made. Well, it turns out McDonald's has been actively trying to clean up the McNuggets reputation. In 2014, they released a video that shows just how those nuggets are made. And while there's no pink slime in sight, it's still not exactly appetizing. We don't know what it is or where it came from, but it has nothing to do with our Chicken McNuggets. The video is from McDee's Canada, but NPR reported it's the same deal in the US. After the breast meat is removed from the bone, it's sent through a grinder with seasoning and chicken skin. They're battered twice, par-fried, frozen, and shipped off to stores to finish cooking them. If you make your own fries at home, you typically use potatoes, oil, salt, and maybe some seasoning. But if you think you're getting the same thing at McDee's, you're wrong. Check out their signature recipe and you'll find a whopping 19 ingredients to be exact. So what is all that stuff? The Daily Mail reported that natural beef flavor and citric acid are added to the oil those potatoes are fried in, and they're coated with a mix of salt, dextrose, and sodium acid pyrophosphate. That last one keeps them from turning brown after they've cooked. It's a fry show, McDonald's world famous fries. But speaking of that so-called beef flavoring, if you're a strict vegetarian traveling the world, you might want to take a pass on any fries that are labeled vegetarian. In 2002, McDonald's was the target of a huge uproar amongst Hindus living in India. In spite of the fact that hash browns and fries were both clearly labeled as being vegetarian in that country, they were fried in oil that contained, you guessed it, essence of beef. That's not just a matter of false advertising forcing people to unknowingly break with vegetarianism. In the Hindu religion, not eating beef is a steadfast spiritual practice for many. Cows are sacred to some, and not surprisingly, people were outraged. CBS News reported McDonald's promised to make amends by changing the way their fries are made in India and donating $10 million to Hindu groups. They also added that nowhere in America have they advertised that their fries are vegetarian because they're absolutely not. ThoughtCo reached out to McDonald's in 2017 and they responded saying they have no intentions of changing their recipes or making fries vegetarian in the US. Exactly why remains a mystery. In 2017, BuzzFeed spoke to the Louisiana teen at the center of a viral outrage. Going by just his first name, Nick claimed he was told to clean the ice cream machine at the McDonald's where he worked. That's where he found trays filled with mold and slime. So he tweeted photos. I couldn't believe my eyes. I was like, I've never seen something this disgusting. Other McDonald's employees and former employees came forward to support him, saying it was management's job to clean the machines and it was rarely done right. Nick was fired after his tweets, and McDonald's was quick to clarify that the trays pictured never come into contact with food, which made it no less gross. According to the Wall Street Journal, cleaning a McFlurry machine is an 11-step process that should include a 4-hour heat cleaning cycle. That's not counting the time it takes to run the other steps, prep the machine for cleaning, and get things up and running again. But here's the rub, McDonald's knows how difficult they are to clean, promising in early 2017 that the machines would be replaced. Food Beast checked in 8 months later, and nothing had changed. Can I try a bite? How, how do I share? I mean, I could get my own spoon. <clears throat> no. According to a Reddit thread that asked, McDonald's employees, what is the worst thing that has ever happened in the play place? It should probably just be called poop place for accuracy's sake. Employees revealed a ton of stories about kids pooping in the slide and others sliding through it, as well as in the crawl tubes and definitely in the ball pit. One said there was almost always a layer of forgotten food at the bottom of the ball pit and then swore the contents of the pit were 50% edible, 25% balls, and 25% poop. Tongue-in-cheek, maybe, but were they kind of right? 
According to Gizmodo, Dr. Erin Carr Jordan, a professor of developmental psychology and mother of four, was understandably concerned about just what her kids were playing in at McDonald's. Uh, you name it, uh, if it's a thing you don't want your child being exposed to, we found it inside these playlands. She took sample swabs from numerous PlayPlace playgrounds. With Wired reporting, they came back positive for listeria, staph, and tons of other nasty bacteria you wouldn't want your kids exposed to. But the story gets even worse. When Dr. Carr Jordan approached a McDonald's manager after seeing a child lick the equipment in one particular play place, she was served with legal documents banning her from McDonald's for being disruptive. New touchscreen kiosks make ordering a breeze, but you might want to hose down after you use them. Who wants a Happy Meal? I do! In 2018, the UK's Metro swapped eight McDonald's touchscreens, six in London and two in Birmingham. Dr. Paul Matwelly, a senior lecturer in microbiology from the London Metropolitan University, said of the findings, We were all surprised how much gut and fecal bacteria there was on the touchscreen machines. These cause the kind of infections that people pick up in hospitals. The bacteria strains were no joke either. One touchscreen showed Staphylococcus, a bacteria that's becoming increasingly resilient to antibiotics. Listeria was also found at two locations, and three-quarters of the locations tested positive for Proteus, which is typically found in soil, animal, and human feces. McDonald's claimed the touchscreens are cleaned regularly, but Madwelly suggested the disinfectant might not be strong enough, particularly considering the number of people that use the screen then eat their food without washing their hands. McDonald's has had some iconic characters doing the heavy lifting when it comes to advertising, but you might not have noticed that one in particular seemed to drop off the face of the earth in 2002. Yes, the Hamburglar vanished, and according to a McDonald's spokesperson via CNN, he was actually, quote, lying low and living a quiet life. That explains so much. But his return in 2015 had people thinking he was all kinds of creepy. Rebel, rebel. The character got a complete makeover from cute costumed character into an actual adult man. While some thought the new look was oddly alluring, I'm gonna venture to say, I find him attractive. She finds creepy people hot. No! Adweek reported others took to Twitter to state the complete opposite. Suggesteraunt called him the creepy guy at your high school reunion that makes you wonder what went wrong, which isn't really the vibe you'd expect anyone to be going for. <gasps> that's so you! You're rocking that! There's not much that's creepier than using toys to lure children through the doors of your establishment. And according to the Center for Science and the Public Interest, that's exactly what McDonald's is doing with the toys they've been putting in their Happy Meals. For years. CSPI litigation director Stephen Gardner even went as far as to say, McDonald's is the stranger in the playground handing out candy to children. McDonald's use of toys undercuts parental authority and exploits young children's developmental immaturity. All this to induce children to prefer foods that may harm their health. It's a creepy and predatory practice that warrants an injunction. And the Happy Meal fun goes on and on and on when you ask your parents to download the McPlay app. In 2010, CSPI filed a class action lawsuit to stop what they say is effectively bribing kids to want to go to McDonald's at an age when lifelong eating practices are being shaped. Reuters reported the suit was ultimately dismissed without public explanation. So that leaves it up to you to decide if one of their major marketing campaigns is smart or grossly irresponsible. It only takes a few seconds to hear what greens lovers want. The simpler, the better. Being a fan of McDonald's ice cream isn't easy. You get your hopes up for a cone and cruise through the drive-thru, only to be told the ice cream machine is broken. Again. It's a problem nearly every McDonald's fan has likely experienced at least once in their lives. And without a functioning ice cream machine, there are no ice cream cones, no sundaes, and none of your beloved McFlurries. The problem has gotten so bad that fans are turning to social media to decry the lack of frozen treats. In 2016, it was the most common service-related complaint to McDonald's on Twitter. And if anything, the problem has only gotten worse since then. Apparently, there's a perfectly good reason that McDonald's ice cream machines seem to be broken almost more often than they're working. They're not broken. According to a 2017 Wall Street Journal investigation, industrial soft-serve machines must go through a laborious cleaning cycle that can last hours. It's an 11-step process that includes using a sanitizer solution to clean seven removable parts. 
There are also two irremovable parts that must be scrubbed for at least 60 seconds before the entire outside of the machine is wiped down with a sanitized towel. During this labor-intensive process, the machines are unable to serve up any frosty goodness. And if the crew is busy serving customers, cooking food, or cleaning other parts of the restaurant, the machine sits unassembled and inoperable. The soft-serve machines also go through a four-hour heat cleaning cycle every night to get rid of any bacteria lingering on the inside. And some employees may start that process early to get a head start on closing up. If that's the case, you're out of luck. Not to mention many McDonald's are now open 24 hours, meaning there's really no time to clean the machine without disappointing a few ice cream-loving customers. To McDonald's credit, they do seem to be aware of the issue and in March 2017, revealed a plan to replace the old ice cream machines with newer versions that have fewer parts to clean and would be easier for employees to maintain. Unfortunately, customers are still waiting for those magical machines to materialize. In November 2017, a McDonald's representative told Business Insider that while the company had identified which new machines would work best, they had yet to actually purchase the machines and move them into stores. Of course, the problem with the ice cream machines isn't always that they need to be cleaned. Every now and then, when an employee tells you that it's broken, it actually is. Many of the machines are reportedly old and temperamental, which makes them prone to breaking down. Richard Adams, a consultant to McDonald's franchises, told the Wall Street Journal that he once conducted a survey showing that 25% of McDonald's restaurants weren't selling ice cream because the machines were truly broken. Not surprisingly, McDonald's doesn't seem to be in a hurry to fix or replace the machines that are frequently breaking, probably because the new machines are eventually on the way. In response to the perpetual lack of ice cream at the Golden Arches, one frustrated customer went so far as to develop an app to address the issue. Raina McCloud created the free app called Ice Check solely for the purpose of warning customers about McDonald's locations where the ice cream machine was on the fritz. And rival fast food giant Wendy's took an opportunity to throw some serious shade at McDonald's during a 2018 Ask Me Anything Reddit session with the company's social media team. Wendy's couldn't help but take the bait when a Redditor asked why McDonald's ice cream machines were always broken, writing, Same reason they serve round burgers, cause they cut corners. Ouch! Whether the ice cream machine is truly broken or it's just in the middle of a lengthy cleaning process, the availability of soft serve at McDonald's is always a gamble. Cross your fingers the new machines arrive sometime soon. Or just go grab a Frosty. There are plenty of people out there who would argue that McDonald's world-famous fries are the best thing to come out of the Golden Arches. But how did they actually end up on your tray or in that drive through bag? Let's find out. McDonald's decided to share all about how their famous fries are made after years of people asking if they used some sort of potato goo to get the process started. Well, there's no goo here. According to McDonald's, their world-famous fries start with whole, fresh-from-the-ground potatoes grown on U.S. farms. The potatoes McDonald's uses are so ideal for their famous fries that they weren't willing to stray from them a few years ago and move to another option. When J.R. Simplot engineered the innate potato, a variety that would bruise less and release fewer compounds when fried, a McDonald's spokesperson said they had no intention of switching to the GMO product. They said, McDonald's USA does not source GMO potatoes, nor do we have current plans to change our sourcing practice. Long live the real potato! McDonald's serves up a very specific shape of fry, and that comes from the way the potatoes are cut. The potato cutting machine looks like a giant wood chipper shooting potatoes into high-pressure water knives at 60 to 70 miles per hour. One McDonald's factory employee on Reddit went even further to describe the machine's incredible strength, making it sound, well, terrifying. They said, quote, "...somebody stepped in a water waste flume once and got sucked under and almost drowned. Someone passing by had to pull him out. This wasn't a flume where fries go, but it still has water moving about the same speed." For the flumes that carry product, just imagine a few hundred pounds of fries every minute going by at lightning speed. If you look closely at McDonald's ingredient list for their fries, you'll notice a few ingredients that definitely aren't potatoes. Two of those, dextrose and sodium acid pyrophosphate, are added at the factory, essentially giving the cut potatoes a nice chemical bath. There's no need to worry, though. According to Healthline, dextrose is a simple sugar made from corn, which is often used as a sweetener. The Center for Science in the Public Interest says sodium acid pyrophosphate actually reduces the levels of acrylamide, a carcinogen present when potatoes are fried, so there might be some chemical additions we should be applauding. As an added bonus, they also help keep those fries a delicious golden color, no matter where in the world you order them. 
Once the fries are cut and bathed, they're partially fried at the factory to speed up the cooking process later on once they arrive in stores. According to one McDonald's factory employee's AMA on Reddit, the processing is all part of setting the store up for success. Uncooked food is harder to manage bacteria growth. It's also easier if the restaurants can just reheat than actually cook. The fries then travel about 50 yards through a flash freezer tunnel to complete the process, which is crucial for their uniform appearance and storage. One of the most unique additives you'll see listed among McDonald's French fries ingredients is their, quote, natural beef flavor. Yes, you heard that correctly, natural beef flavor. And we owe it to that added beef flavor for not being able to put those beautiful French fries down. Years ago, McDonald's used to fry their French fries in beef fat, and it just became part of their signature flavor. According to NPR, the company switched to a vegetable oil base to quell concerns about saturated fat, but still incorporated essence of beef until vegetarian groups protested. Today, McDonald's continues to mimic that flavor with the help of their natural beef flavor containing hydrolyzed wheat and hydrolyzed milk, which makes it safe for vegetarians, but not vegans. During service, especially during busy times, fries are made pretty much constantly. When it's time to put a fry basket down, the fries are actually designed to cook within three minutes, all thanks to the preparation beforehand in the factory. At one time, McDonald's used a partially hydrogenated oil for their fries, until they completely switched over in 2008 to eliminate trans fats. They spent seven years on the hunt for a replacement, testing 18 different types of oils before they ultimately decided on Clear Valley High Oleic Canola Oil, which allowed McDonald's to fry in an oil with no trans fats and the lowest saturated fat content of any of the vegetable oils. According to McDonald's, they figured out the ideal amount of salt for their fries based on their customers. In answering one of their FAQs on the McDonald's UK website asking about why McDonald's fries have so much salt on them, they responded by explaining, Extensive research has shown that the majority of McDonald's consumers prefer a light sprinkling of salt on their french fries. A typical serving of a small portion of french fries contains 0.5 grams of salt. With that standard, that puts a small order of fries serving up to 160 milligrams of sodium and large with 350 milligrams of sodium. Compared to your daily recommended amount of sodium of around 1,500 milligrams, that's not outrageous after all, is it? McDonald's Canada took to their website to answer the many questions their customers have about their food, and one popular topic was how long fries sit in the heat tray before they are finally discarded. Corporate told one inquirer, The longest amount of time will keep our world-famous fries before serving them to you is seven minutes, but their popularity means they're usually on your tray and in your mouth much faster than that. No, sorry, mate. Five-second rule. I thought it was a ten-second rule. No, it's definitely five seconds. Uh, seven? Righto, seven. Six and seven. Time's up. And what about the thing where customers think they're pulling one over on Mickey D's by asking for fries with no salt just to get a fresh batch? According to another crew member on Reddit, all you need to do in order to get fresh fries is ask. Did you know that you can simply ask for fresh fries if that's what you wanted? They'll actually most likely be newer than asking for no salt. But if you do ask for fresh fries, be sure to remember they will take a few more minutes than normal. One employee told Reddit it takes about three and a half minutes to complete the order. And that's actually not long at all to wait for that box of golden deliciousness. In October 2015, McDonald's debuted the all-day breakfast menu, and people everywhere rejoiced at the idea of eating cheap and delicious breakfast food around the clock. But all-day breakfast is just the latest innovation in Mickey D's long and checkered food history. Here's a look at some things you didn't know about McDonald's breakfast. Behold the Egg McMuffin Back in the day, not only did McDonald's not serve breakfast all day, they actually didn't serve breakfast at all. It wasn't until 1970 that franchisee Jim Delegati, who also invented the Big Mac, came up with the idea of serving breakfast at the McDonald's he owned and operated. But it didn't become a national phenomenon until 1971, when fellow franchise owner Herb Peterson fed McDonald's head honcho Ray Kroc an innovation the world now knows as the Egg McMuffin. Kroc loved it so much he brought it to the company's senior management, and by 1976, every McDonald's in the country had a full breakfast menu. I hereby proclaim breakfast at participating McDonald's every weekend! Yeah! Haters gonna hate. It's so frustrating. You race to McDonald's, glance at Mickey, and oh no, it's 10.33. You're three minutes late, no breakfast for you. Luckily, those days are gone now. 
But while fans of hash browns may love all-day breakfast, not everyone at McDonald's is actually loving it. Some franchises had to invest a lot of money in order to make their restaurants capable of serving breakfast alongside the standard menu items. Others felt like they were rushed into service and wanted more time to introduce the new menu. And some were concerned about menu items that all-day breakfast pushed off the menu, like some McWraps. Though all-day breakfast proved to be a massive hit initially, by 2017 it was reported that sales were slumping once again. So was the convenience of all-day breakfast worth all the effort? Only your mouth knows the answer. They're invested in the coffee game. By 2006, McDonald's was one of the dominant forces in the breakfast market, selling one out of every 10 cups of coffee in the United States to the tune of $19 billion a year. But with upscale coffee shops like Starbucks cutting into their action, McDonald's was forced to up their game. In 2009, they introduced the McCafe line of drinks, which offer cheaper and faster alternatives to Starbucks coffee and lattes. And they haven't stopped yet. By 2020, 100% of their coffee will come from sustainable sources. There are healthy breakfast options. You don't need a degree in nutrition to realize some of the breakfast options at McDonald's can be kind of unhealthy. The Big Breakfast with hotcakes, for instance, contains your entire daily recommended fat intake in just one meal, plus more than half of your recommended daily allowance of sodium. But there are a few healthier options if you know where to look. The Egg McMuffin, for instance, clocks in at 300 calories, 12 grams of fat, and 730 milligrams of sodium. And while that's a bit high in fat and sodium, you do get 18 grams of protein. More humane food. One of the most central ingredients on the McDonald's breakfast menu is eggs. How central? McDonald's actually uses more than 4% of all the eggs produced in the United States. And they're committed to making sure those eggs are gathered in the most humane way possible, as they've committed to going completely cage-free in their North American restaurants by 2025. That decision may have been influenced by the Great Pork Scandal of 2011, when their pork supplier, Smithfield, was accused by the Humane Society of lying to shareholders about their animal welfare practices. It turned out that the company used gestation cages, meaning their sows lived in a place so small that during their entire lifetime they couldn't even turn around. In response, McDonald's pledged that by 2022, all of its U.S. pork suppliers would phase out the use of these inhumane crates. The options are very different abroad. If you've ever traveled outside of the United States, you've surely noticed some of the variations in the McDonald's breakfast menu, depending on where you go. For example, if you're traveling in the Middle East, you're not going to find the pork on the menu at all because it's forbidden in Islam. And that's just one regional variation. Depending on where you are, you can also order a Georgie pie, Stroop waffles, a halloumi muffin, or a brekkie wrap, among many others. So before you order a McDonald's breakfast overseas, make sure you actually know what you're getting. Happy breakfast! Everybody loves Happy Meals, so why don't they have a breakfast Happy Meal? Well, it turns out they do! Back in 2016, McDonald's rolled out a pilot program in the Tulsa, Oklahoma area, testing a breakfast Happy Meal in 73 locations. There were two basic options, one centering on McRiddles and the other on Egg McMuffins. So far, Mickey D's hasn't rolled out the breakfast Happy Meal to the rest of the country, but here's hoping! After all, everyone wants their food to come with a prize. It all comes in a Happy Meal box, with games, puzzles, jokes, and a prize! A prize? Some eight decades ago, the McDonald's brothers opened their restaurant with a very different vision than what it would eventually become. As times changed, the McDonald's menu changed, with items appearing and disappearing. Here's what McDonald's menu looked like the year you were born. Brothers Maurice and Richard McDonald's opened the first McDonald's on the corner of 14th and Northeast Streets in San Bernardino, California, on May 15, 1940. But this restaurant looked nothing like the ones we've come to know today. It had no indoor seating and only a few stools at an outside counter. Most customers would just pull their cars into the parking lot and have their food served to them by car hops. But the most notable difference between that first McDonald's and what the chain would eventually become was its early focus on barbecue. The brothers would slow cook meat for hours in a barbecue pit, filled with hickory chips that they imported all the way from Arkansas. The barbecue stand quickly gained popularity, with annual sales topping $200,000. The first McDonald's location was successful, but it wasn't because of the barbecue. Instead, 
Hamburgers were accounting for 80% of the restaurant's sales. The brothers shut the restaurant down for three months in 1948 and completely overhauled the business model. When it reopened, McDonald's had become a self-service eatery. Most importantly, it pared down its menu to just hamburgers, cheeseburgers, soft drinks, milk, coffee, potato chips, and a slice of pie. The hamburger cost just 15 cents. Hi, welcome to McDonald's. May I take your order? Yeah, give me a uh, hamburger and french fries and a Coca-Cola. That'd be 35 cents, please. Not only was the menu a noticeable change, but McDonald's was revolutionizing the food service industry. Its entire operation was now based on speed, consistency, and keeping costs and prices as low as possible. Inspired by Henry Ford and automobile manufacturing, McDonald's implemented an assembly line production of hamburgers. This ensured that each hamburger was made exactly the same and could be delivered to customers without any weight. This low-cost, high-volume business model is still a hallmark of McDonald's today. It's difficult to imagine McDonald's not offering French fries. After all, it serves 9 million pounds of fries each day, making them the restaurant's most popular item. But believe it or not, French fries weren't always on the menu. Even after McDonald's switched from barbecue to burgers, the restaurant was struggling when it first reopened in 1948. Once the McDonald's brothers swapped out potato chips for french fries, however, sales went up, and the rest is history. McDonald's french fries haven't been completely without controversy. Up until the 1990s, the fries were cooked in beef tallow, which is high in cholesterol. After some public uproar, McDonald's switched to vegetable oil. The McDonald's Corporation owes a great deal of its success to its franchising business model. But franchisees have contributed to far more than just the bottom line. These independent business owners created many, if not most, of the famous fast food restaurant's iconic menu items. That trend started with the filet fish in 1959, Lou Groan opened the first McDonald's in the Cincinnati area, specifically in Montfort Heights. There was one problem with owning a hamburger restaurant in this neighborhood. The population was 87% Catholic, and back in the early years of Groan's business, Catholics would avoid meat on all Fridays throughout the year. To stay afloat, Groan devised a new fish sandwich to sell. He took the idea to McDonald's's chief, Ray Kroc, who had his own meatless menu idea, a slice of pineapple on a bun called the Hula Burger. Kroc agreed to put both on the menu and see which sold best. The filet fish won overwhelmingly. Jim Delegati opened his first of several McDonald's restaurants in Pittsburgh in 1957. However, the restaurants were suffering from low sales volumes. To fix this, Delegati thought he needed to add to the menu in hopes that it would broaden the customer base. Delegati had previously managed a big boy drive-in chain that had a double-decker sandwich on its menu. When it came time to add to his McDonald's menu, he created his own riff on this by combining two beef patties, lettuce, cheese, pickles, and onions on a bun. The final ingredient was a special sauce that to this day remains a secret. Aside from its taste, the burger has been aided by some successful marketing, including an unforgettable commercial jingle. It's your McDonald's Big Mac. You've got to taste it to believe it, you know what I mean? The restaurant chain estimated in 2007 that it was selling approximately 550 million Big Macs in the United States each year. The Quarter Pounder trails only the Big Mac on the list of McDonald's most iconic burgers. So famous is it that it found its way into one of the most famous bits of dialogue in recent movie history. And you know what they call a, a, a Quarter Pounder with cheese uh, in Paris? They don't call it a Quarter Pounder with cheese? Oh man, they got the metric system. McDonald's released the Quarter Pounder burger nationwide beginning in 1973. It was invented by Al Bernardin, a McDonald's corporate employee who eventually rose to become head of the McDonald's training center, Hamburger University. But his most notable contribution came after he left headquarters to open a McDonald's franchise in Fremont, California, wanting to satiate customers looking for, as he said, a higher ratio of meat to bun, Bernardin came up with a more substantial burger. Yet another franchisee-created menu item came about in the mid-1970s with the introduction of the Egg McMuffin. This breakfast staple was the brainchild of Herb Peterson, who owned a McDonald's in Santa Barbara, California. 
Peterson believed McDonald's could be a successful morning hours restaurant but didn't think people wanted to eat burgers for breakfast. A fan of Eggs Benedict, Peterson experimented with a sandwich version of the dish. As chewing hollandaise sauce because of its messiness, Peterson placed butter and cheese on top of an egg, along with Canadian bacon, all in between an English muffin. Not only was the Egg McMuffin another popular menu item, but it opened a whole new market for McDonald's. By 1981, breakfast accounted for nearly 20% of the restaurant's sales. In the late 1970s, a McDonald's St. Louis regional advertising manager, Dick Brams, suggested the idea of creating a meal just for kids. In 1979, it came to fruition when a circus wagon-themed Happy Meal was served. It had most of the same components you'll find today — a hamburger or cheeseburger, french fries, cookies, and a soft drink. The final and most important Happy Meal ingredient is the toy. Back then, lucky kids received a stencil, wallet, ID bracelet, puzzle lock, spinning top, or McDonald's Land character eraser. Nowadays, the toys change nearly every week. Over the years, they have included Transformers, Hello Kitty, Legos, Teletubbies, and G.I. Joe. The most notable upgrade occurred in 1987, when Disney character toys first appeared. In the 1970s, McDonald's faced a very difficult challenge as consumer behavior began to shift. It was during this time that the government began recommending people eat less red meat due to its high fat and cholesterol content. Wanting to keep the customers who were eating less beef, the restaurant looked to chicken for help. Their first few ideas, including fried chicken and a deep-fried chicken pot pie, failed. Eventually, they decided to simplify the dish by cutting the chicken into chunks, battering it, and throwing it in the fryer. Just five months later, in 1980, McDonald's served its first Chicken McNuggets in Knoxville, Tennessee. It would take a few years for the company to build out their restaurant's infrastructures to be able to make the countless nuggets they would need to, but in 1983, Chicken McNuggets finally became available nationwide. The McRib made its way onto McDonald's menus in the early 1980s. As it turns out, it was the result of the popularity of the recently introduced Chicken McNuggets. Consumers were buying so many nuggets that it resulted in a chicken shortage. In order to give diners another option, McDonald's created a pork sandwich. But just a few years after its debut, it was pulled from menus and replaced with the McDLT, a burger that came with lettuce and tomato. Though this doesn't seem like a revolutionary idea, McDonald's had long resisted adding vegetables to their burgers. It wasn't until they came up with a two-compartment storage box that kept hot and cold ingredients separated that the restaurant relented. As for the McRib, it made a brief return in 1994. Since then, it has been an elusive item to find, popping up on the McDonald's menu here and there for a limited time. By the mid-1980s, McDonald's was bringing in $11 billion in sales per year. During this time, the fast food pizza industry was growing rapidly. Despite pizza and hamburgers not necessarily being a natural fit, McDonald's wanted a slice of the proverbial pie. The company's pizza testing started in 1986 and expanded a few years later, and by the 1990s, approximately 40% of the McDonald's locations in the United States were serving pizza. But that's about as far as it got. The product had notable problems that eventually caused it to be removed from the menu. Restaurants needed new equipment to make pizza and had to remodel their kitchens. Furthermore, pizza takes time to cook, so customers had extended wait times. The McDonald's health kick continued into the 1990s as critics continued to rail against fast food restaurants' limited offerings. Eventually, McDonald's unveiled the McLean Deluxe. It contained just 9% fat by weight, significantly less than the 20% most of the restaurant's other burgers had. The McLean had a lot of things going against it. Most evident was a lack of flavor. Low fat and delicious? Can't be done. Seasoned water was added to the beef patties to make up for the missing fat, most of which burned off in the cooking. The McLean dried out quickly, so it had to be made to order, which went completely against McDonald's' business model of getting customers in and out as quickly as possible. All this, plus the fact that the burger was also McDonald's' most expensive, led to the McLean having a short shelf life. McDonald's added some big hits to its dessert menu in the early 1990s. 
First came the baked apple pie, introduced in 1992. The restaurant, of course, had already been serving apple pie going back as far as the 1960s, but these pies were fried, and with increased health concerns, sales waned. So McDonald's updated the apple pie by baking it instead. A few years later, a creative franchise owner in Canada named Ron McClellan came up with what would prove to be McDonald's signature dessert, the McFlurry. This concoction of soft-serve ice cream mixed with candy was first served at McClellan's restaurant in Bathurst, New Brunswick. It has since spread to menus around the world. In an attempt to appeal to more adults, McDonald's created the Arch Deluxe, a more expensive burger, which was a quarter pound of beef, bacon, lettuce, tomato, cheese, onions, ketchup, and secret sauce. McDonald's has always been known for its cheap, quick food, so trying to go for a more sophisticated look did not work. Sales of the burger disappointed, a fact that on its own may not have been a disaster. But McDonald's spent $150 million and created a huge marketing campaign to promote its new product. The Arch Deluxe was phased out in 1998 and was gone from menus completely by 2000. McDonald's opened a new type of store to kick off the 21st century. It was supposed to be more upscale than a typical fast food outlet, with leather couches, bistro-style tables, and food served on fine china with stainless steel flatware. Although all McCafes were located within or adjacent to traditional McDonald's restaurants, the menu was significantly different. As the name implies, its offerings included gourmet coffees, teas, pastries, and desserts. Brick-and-mortar McCafe locations didn't last long, and since 2009, McCafe food and beverage items have become fully integrated into the traditional McDonald's menu. Beginning in 2002, McDonald's offered several different items for just $1 each. These included a McChicken sandwich, McValue fries, a small or medium soft drink, a fruit and yogurt parfait, a side salad, two baked apple pies, a sundae, and the restaurant's newest burger at the time, the Big and Tasty. The idea behind the dollar menu was to lure customers in with extremely inexpensive food and then try to upsell them with other items in hopes of getting them to spend more. The strategy only half worked. The people came, but they didn't spend, at least not enough for the menu to work. During the first month of the dollar menu's existence, the chain's average check total actually fell three cents in value. Any fan of Coca-Cola will tell you it tastes better from a fountain, and anyone who's ever had it from McDonald's will tell you their fountain Coke is just about the best there is. So what's their secret? Are they serving up a higher quality of Coca-Cola than other restaurants? A McDonald's spokesperson told the New York Post that's not the case, saying, Despite the speculation, there is no secret formula to our recipe. Still, they do have a few tricks up their sleeve to ensure their Coke tastes as good as it does. In a nutshell, McDonald's takes their Coke dispensing very, very seriously seriously. According to the New York Times, the difference starts in the delivery of the product. While other restaurants receive their syrup in bags, McDonald's gets theirs delivered in stainless steel tanks, ensuring it stays fresh until it's ready to serve. McDonald's also strictly adheres to the guidelines set by Coke for serving the bubbly beverage, according to the McDonald's website, and the most important of those is temperature. Both the syrup and the water are pre-chilled before they enter the fountain, and they go to great lengths to make sure it stays cold. A spokesperson for McDonald's explained to the New York Post that the soda water is chilled to temperatures just above freezing and is circulated from the refrigeration unit in the back of the restaurant to all the serving stations up front using insulated tubing. This ensures your McDonald's Coke is always ice cold and sufficiently carbonated. But that's only the beginning. Not just any water will do when it comes time to mix up that precious concoction. The soda water at McDonald's is put through a high-end water filtration system to make sure it meets their gold standard. Plus, the syrup to water ratio is specially formulated to allow for some ice to melt. So don't cheat yourself and go ice-free just to get a bit more beverage. It just won't taste the same. And finally, even the straw comes into play to achieve the best-tasting Coke on the planet. Have you ever noticed that the straws for McDonald's are wider than the average straw? That's by design. McDonald's says they engineered an extra-wide straw so that, quote, all that Coke taste can hit all your taste buds. Except for that one in the back that's really hard to reach. Sorry, little guy. McDonald's is famous for its burgers, selling approximately 75 every second. Of course, this means that the fast food giant must be doing something right when sandwiching their signature all-beef patties inside of a simple bun. 
But what makes these burgers so delicious? Here's the secret. Contrary to widespread rumor, all of their patties are actually made from 100% USDA-inspected beef. Prior to 2011, like many other fast food chain restaurants in the United States, McDonald's did use the meat-based filler commonly known as pink slime in their burgers. The substance in question was beef, but only technically. Pink slime is actually made from finely textured beef trimmings that are then treated with ammonia before being ground up into a pink paste. Is it gross? Yes, but thankfully pink slime is no longer an ingredient in McDonald's hamburgers. In 2014, as part of a widespread effort to debunk the negative consumer perceptions that surrounded their beef products, the company hired former Mythbuster Grant Imahara to prove to customers that their well-known claim to serve all beef patties was true. Imahara went to the Cargill Processing Plant in Fresno, California to see for himself what goes into a McDonald's 100% beef patty. In the end, he found that McDonald's patties are indeed 100% beef as claimed. You may have heard that McDonald's burgers are made from entire cows that are put through a meat grinder. However, many media outlets, including Snopes, have gone on to prove that this is not in fact the case. The process could not be more different from what the public might perceive. Here is my hot and fresh quarter pounder with cheese. Oh, that looks good. McDonald's makes their patties out of a few specific cuts of beef, which is crucial to ensuring that their products are of a high enough quality to compete in today's market. While you won't find any of the fanciest butcher's cuts in your McDonald's burgers, they do use the trimmings from cuts like chuck, round, and even sirloin to create the familiar flavor profile of their signature beef blend. And while they don't boast their meat as being grass-fed, the cows they use are for the most part fed on grass for the first half of their lives, before being finished on a diet of grass, minerals, and grain. Immediately after the ground beef blend is formed into patties in the processing plant, there's another important step that contributes to the classic flavor we've come to know and love from the Golden Arches. The standard McDonald's burger is flash frozen immediately after shaping, in order to ensure that it is as fresh as possible when it hits the grill at your local restaurant. Unlike slower freezing processes, which can cause larger ice crystals to form in foods, flash freezing can chill foods to temperatures below zero degrees Fahrenheit in just minutes. The flash freezing process has changed the way Americans eat, and it's been used for a long time. It was developed by Clarence Birdseye, the founder of Birdseye Frozen Foods in 1924, and is responsible for much of the convenience food we enjoy today. As McDonald's explained, it typically takes between two to three weeks from the day a burger patty is formed in a processing plant to the day it is served to a customer. As such, flash freezing is one way that McDonald's ensures they're serving hamburgers that taste as fresh as they possibly can for each and every customer. Even though flash freezing is a very effective way to get fresh-tasting, delicious burgers in the hands of customers, it is not without some serious drawbacks. Over the years, McDonald's has come under fire multiple times for the practice. Even rival fast-food burger chain Wendy's has repeatedly taunted McDonald's for their use of frozen beef patties in ad campaigns. In an effort to combat the negative perceptions about their burgers and to compete within the better burger space pioneered by higher-end fast food chains like Shake Shack, McDonald's made a commitment to make all of their quarter pounders with fresh beef that is cooked to order by mid-2018. The reception to the change was overwhelmingly positive, with even Food & Wine magazine saying that the freshly made quarter pounder patty is surprisingly good. Just one year after making the change, QSR magazine reported that McDonald's had sold more than 40 million more quarter pounders than the previous year. Cheeseburger, cheeseburger, two Pepsi, one chip. McDonald's really prides itself on the fact that their burgers, both fresh and frozen alike, are made with beef, salt, pepper, and absolutely nothing else. But they don't stop at a short list of ingredients. They actually take things a step further. At McDonald's, seasonings aren't added at all until the burgers reach their local grills, where the cooks add salt and pepper as the patties are grilled to order. According to McDonald's, this brings out all that great beef taste. Interestingly, there's some leeway in how McDonald's restaurants season their signature burgers. McDonald's representatives told Business Insider that they actually adjust the seasoning based on the country that the burgers are being served in, because some countries prefer their burgers a little more on the salty side than others. Unsurprisingly, American customers have a tendency to like their fast food on the salty side. Reuters reported that one order of McDonald's chicken nuggets served in the United States contains 1.5 grams of salt, compared with only 0.6 grams of salt in the UK. The salt content in burgers doesn't vary nearly as much, though. They found, overall, fast food burgers served up an average of 1.3 grams of salt, or 520 grams of sodium, across all countries, with only small national differences. 
McDonald's makes a serious effort to use locally produced beef whenever it is possible. According to the fast food chain's website, the beef used in the burgers served in the United States comes from a handful of producers within the country, a practice that makes the fast food giant one of the largest purchasers of USDA-inspected beef in the entire country. However, they also supplement their stock with meat from USDA-approved producers in New Zealand, Australia, and Canada. According to Business Insider, the company also works hard to ensure that the cows they use for meat are slaughtered in their country of origin, as this helps to reduce the need to transport livestock across long distances, which also helps keep a focus on locally sourced ingredients. At McDonald's, a burger bun is more than just a vehicle for a great sandwich. It is also a critical part of ensuring burger perfection. Take the chain's signature Big Mac, for example. Oftentimes, when you are served a burger that contains two or even three patties, you are still only going to get two pieces of bread. The imbalance between bread and meat in a larger burger can easily lead to what Business Insider writer Hollis Johnson referred to as beef overload. The Big Mac is different from its competitors' mega burgers thanks in part to the club bun, that third piece of bread sandwiched between the Big Mac's double patties. Like McDonald's other deluxe-style burgers, including the Quarter Pounder and the Double Quarter Pounder, the bun is toasted and topped with sesame seeds. However, not all sandwiches get the sesame seed treatment. The chain's standard hamburger, cheeseburger, and double cheeseburgers are all served on a regular toasted bun, as are some non-burger sandwiches, like the McChicken. The filet o fish on the other hand, is in a league of its own, with its plain steamed bun. There's one more thing at work here too, the perfect toast. In 2015, McDonald's decided that in order to ensure juicier, hotter burgers, they would toast their buns for an additional 5 seconds, which would lead to their burgers being 15 degrees hotter overall. Another change came along with the addition of fresh beef to the quarter pounder, which gets a bun that has been toasted for a total of approximately 22 seconds. The components that make up a McDonald's hamburger, such as beef patties and buns, are not made on site in local stores. Because of that, the company has to rely on a select few trusted vendors to produce ingredients for them. Since their production is so spread out, not only across the United States but all over the world, the chain requires vendors to adhere to a long list of strict quality control standards that help to ensure a consistent product. Each box of frozen patties, for example, is labeled with such a high level of detail that they can trace any individual burger back to the cow it came from. The company details an extensive food safety and quality management system, including how they hold their vendors accountable on their website. And according to the Orange County Register, there are no second chances for vendors whose work isn't up to snuff. Todd Bacon, head of the fast food chain's U.S. supply chain management, told the publication, "...there's too much at stake for us not to do everything we can." McDonald's has been taking major steps to make their menu seem appealing to a more health-conscious demographic for years. In 2016, the company announced that they were planning to remove high-fructose corn syrup from all of their buns, replacing it with sucrose, according to Business Insider. Even though sucrose is just the scientific name for plain white table sugar, the change in ingredients added to the perception that McDonald's was getting healthier. That same year, according to Fortune, McDonald's also removed artificial preservatives from their chicken nuggets. Then in 2018, McDonald's announced that they were finally going to make changes to their burgers. How? By removing all artificial ingredients. Although this in itself doesn't make a McDonald's burger a healthy choice, removing artificial ingredients is an important step to take in terms of both consumer perception and food quality. After the change, the company proudly stated on its menu that the only component of the burgers that contains any artificial ingredients are the pickles, advising customers to quote, skip the pickle if you like. And another thing, some say hold the pickles. We say hold them in your arms and thank them for helping the Quarter Pounder achieve full deliciousness. It shouldn't come as a surprise that people are passionate about what particular burgers they like best and which ones they would not be rushing to eat again. Yes, people love to rank McDonald's sandwiches, citing the subtle differences between the classic hamburger and the classic cheeseburger, and whether or not a Big Mac is better than a Quarter Pounder with cheese. The main difference between the burgers, aside from the fact that the Quarter Pounder series is made with fresh beef, resulting in a thicker patty, is the toppings. Even a cursory glance at their menu will show you that a Double Quarter Pounder with cheese is very, very different from a Big Mac. While the Quarter Pounder with cheese boasts ketchup, mustard, pickles, onions, and cheese, the Big Mac swaps out ketchup and mustard for its signature Big Mac sauce, and adds shredded lettuce for extra crunch. At this point, you might think that McDonald's has a tendency to micromanage the production of their burgers, and that would not be too far from the truth. In fact, the fast food giant is so obsessive about making sure their burgers will have the consistent great taste their customers expect, they actually build replica test kitchens at their processing plants in order to further monitor quality control. Before a batch of burgers can be sent off to its destination, someone at the processing plant is tasked with cooking up some of the patties in the replica kitchen. There, a series of comprehensive tests for quality are conducted, including ensuring optimal fat content and flavor. Once the patties have passed the test, 
they're cleared to be sent to your local McDonald's restaurant. This is just one component of the chain's overall commitment to quality. According to McDonald's, some of the other steps the chain is taking include a commitment to sustainably sourced beef, rigorous policies concerning the use of antibiotics and livestock, and a back-to-basics approach that manages to stick to the company's roots without issuing innovation. And for the customer, that all just means a more delicious burger. McDonald's employees might have the whole menu at their disposal when it comes time for them to order their own meals, but what do they skip? These are the items that McDonald's employees won't touch, so maybe you shouldn't either. Chicken nuggets might not be the mystery meat they used to be, but according to alleged former McDonald's employees on Reddit, many still give nuggets a miss, despite them being a serious customer favorite. I've eaten them every day for 15 years! And you called 911 because they're out of chicken nuggets? At least employees make sure they're not grabbing some off the stack of food that's ready and waiting to be served. Pre-made batches of nuggets are kept warm by a dual-purpose timer that's supposed to encourage employees to toss nuggets that have been sitting out too long. But multiple employees say that while they use the timer, they would rarely throw the nuggets out and make fresh ones. Instead, they'd just reset the timer. Some claim the nuggets tasted just fine even after sitting through several turns of the timer, while others describe the old nuggets as questionable at best. So specifically ask for fresh nuggets or opt for something else. One McDonald's employee went into extreme detail on Reddit to explain why they refuse to drink any beverage that comes out of the McCafe machine. They claim it's incredibly difficult to clean completely and that, in their experience, it's one of the machines that gets routinely neglected. They describe the insides as being caked with inches of gunk and claim they've seen it at multiple locations. Like all of these tales of terror, it's an instance where it really depends on the location, as several other employees have chimed in to claim that their store cleans their McCafe machine on a nightly basis. But if you don't know for sure how diligent your local employees are, it's probably not worth taking the risk. A number of alleged former employees say to avoid filet of fish or at least ask for one that's made fresh, as ready ones have probably been sitting in a heating cabinet for hours. Other employees claim it's also one of those sandwiches that's just impossible to make neatly. The combination of tartar sauce, cheese, and slightly greasy fish means that when you get it, it's going to be a sloppy mess. The filet of fish is an is a evil cancer square created to destroy America. While some locations likely make fish fresh, it may be limited to the ones with particularly diligent managers who go the extra mile. In 2017, social media had a meltdown when a McDonald's employee from Louisiana posted pictures of a tray he pulled out of the ice cream machine at his location. According to an employee identified as Nick, the drip trays were pretty much never cleaned and typically filled with a moldy, rotten goo. I couldn't believe my eyes. I was like, I've never seen something this disgusting. McDonald's issued a formal response saying that food never came in contact with the tray, which was actually designed to catch the machine's lubrication grease, but was still supposed to be cleaned cleaned on a regular basis. Nick was fired not long after his post, but he's not alone in his warning. Other employees on Reddit thought they pinpointed the real problem. Other employees who didn't care enough about any part of their job, including the complicated process of cleaning an ice cream machine. This might break the hearts of a ton of McRib fans, but multiple employees say that this cultishly adored sandwich is actually one to avoid. One former employee claimed that they saw it before it was sauced and said, it doesn't look like meat at all, it looks like a scab. Other employees claimed that in spite of the McRib's devoted following, not a lot of people actually ordered it. That meant the already funky-looking patty would spend all day in the sauce, making it even funkier. It turns out that the bun might be hiding a lot, and if employees won't eat what they see, maybe you should give it a miss, too. This one's a little different. In 2013, McDonald's warned employees against eating too much fast food on its own employee website, saying in part, while convenient and economical for a busy lifestyle, fast foods are typically high in calories, fat, saturated fat, sugar, and salt, and may put people at risk for becoming overweight. Along with the warning was a photo of a hamburger and fries. Other parts of the post warned cheeseburgers were generally an unhealthy choice. Even stranger, the fries and soda featured in the post were McDonald's red, though they were missing the logo. And that's the most bizarre bit of advice of all. McDonald's recommending that its own employees not eat much of their own food because it's inherently unhealthy. Love it or hate it, McDonald's is one of the most successful fast food chains in the world. Known for its ubiquitous golden arches and convenient, kinda greasy fare, McDonald's restaurants can be found in virtually every city and town in the United States, and in almost every country in the world. But how much do you really know about Mickey D's? Maybe not as much as you think. Here's a look at some false McDonald's facts you always thought were true. 
Ray Kroc started McDonald's. He's often referred to as the founder of McDonald's, but Ray Kroc isn't actually the person who came up with the concept. That credit belongs to Dick and Mac McDonald, two brothers who opened a barbecue drive-in that also had hamburgers on the menu in San Bernardino, California in 1940. By 1954, they had expanded to 21 franchises thanks to their streamlined, speedy service system. That's when Ray Kroc came into the picture, a full 14 years after the chain began. Kroc, whose job was selling milkshake mixers, was so impressed with the McDonald's operation he opened an affiliate franchise in Des Plaines, Illinois. In 1960, in 1961, Kroc bought out the McDonald's brothers and turned the chain into a worldwide phenomenon, while systematically erasing Dick and Mac from the history books. This is Ray Kroc, founder of McDonald's, a man who had a dream 23 years ago. The hot coffee lawsuit was bogus. Ask most people about the hot coffee lawsuit and they'll probably tell you some greedy lady won millions of dollars in a lawsuit after she spilled a splash of coffee on herself. But the reality is quite different. It's true that Stella Liebeck spilled hot coffee on herself and ended up later suing McDonald's, but the lawsuit was anything but bogus. The coffee she received was so hot that it caused third-degree burns on her lap, buttocks, and genitals. As a result, she was hospitalized for eight days and ended up permanently disfigured despite extensive skin grafts and reconstructive surgery. Even with all that, she initially asked McDonald's for just 11 thousand dollars to help cover hospital expenses, and only ended up suing them after they countered with an offer of just $800. Liebeck easily won the case. As it turned out, McDonald's had received hundreds of previous complaints from victims also burned by their coffee. McDonald's ended up paying Liebeck an undisclosed amount, somewhere south of $600,000 as a result. I was not in it for the money. I was in it because I wanted to bring the temperature down so that pe other people would not go through the same thing I did. Pink Slime it's widely known that McDonald's uses beef trimmings treated with ammonia gas in their burgers, a product better known as pink slime, thanks to a crusade by celebrity chef Jamie Oliver. What most people don't know, however, is that McDonald's actually doesn't use pink slime anymore, and hasn't for years. In fact, according to their website, McDonald's discontinued the use of the stuff in 2011. Similar rumors that chicken nuggets are made with pink slime, or that Mickey D's uses worms, horse meat, cow eyeballs, mutant laboratory meat, or human flesh in their dishes are also just not true. Special sauce is top secret. How do you do it? What's your secret? The Big Mac McDonald's signature burger was invented back in 1967, and pretty much everyone knows what's in a Big Mac, right? To all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. Oh, got him! But exactly what is in that special sauce? For decades, people have believed that only a handful of McDonald's top brass know the recipe for special sauce. But that's actually not the case. In fact, you can find the ingredients for the special sauce on their website. And McDonald's actually put out their own video of how to make the stuff at home. A classic Big Mac, homemade, made at home, with ingredients that you can find in your grocery store locally. Enjoy! McDonald's food doesn't decompose. Over the years, there have been quite a few viral posts from folks who have allegedly purchased a McDonald's meal, then preserved it for years after purchase. The result has been that these meals don't appear to decompose, feeding the myth that McDonald's food is so pumped full of preservatives and additives, it's not really even food anymore. But according to McDonald's, the reality the reason these foods don't rot isn't because they are unhealthy, but because of the controlled conditions in which they're stored, photographed, and documented. In fact, any food preserved or stored without moisture will wither and dry up, subsequently not showing regular signs of decomposition. And that's the case with each of these mummified meals. They simply dried up. Your Big Mac is safe to eat. Need proof? It's probably 90% of my, my um, solid diet is probably a Big Mac. And that's Don Gorski, who's eaten a Big Mac every day since 1973. And he's still alive. So go nuts! McDonald's dollar menu has been nothing short of a monumental success for the fast food chain. Or has it? Here's the real history of this popular fast food marketing campaign and all the problems it's caused McDonald's over the years. The dollar menu that people know and love today didn't come along until 2002, but its earliest beginnings can be traced back to 1989. That's when McDonald's launched its, quote, value campaign, with select items at lower permanent price points. They were following the lead of competitors like Taco Bell and Wendy's, both of whom had already premiered their own value menus. A lot of delicious choices, just 99 cents. Oh. What do you have to know to get a seat around here? The McDonald's dollar menu was also a response to a nationwide recession in the U.S., which found the fast food chain struggling well into the 90s. Dollar's down again. Ugh, oh, it's brutal. No, it's feeble. It's dropping like a lead balloon. Tanking. It's, it's a new It's just in free fall. It's pathetic. Hey, big o, what do you got there, fella? Sales slumped again at the dawn of the new millennium, with stocks falling 39% over the course of a year. McDonald's tried boosting sales by revisiting their, quote, permanent discount strategy, this time offering select menu items for only a dollar. The dollar menu was born, baby. 
Customers love being able to grab a burger for a buck. No matter how much I change, I know I can count on McDonald's dollar menu. But many franchisees just see the dollar menu as a way to lose money. Once a franchise owner factors in food, paper, labor, rent, and the 4% service fee they pay to McDonald's, it's pretty hard to make money off a $1 double cheeseburger. There have also been complaints that the dollar menu kills incentive to buy pricier menu items. After all, a Big Mac combo meal isn't so enticing when you can buy a double cheeseburger and fries for two bucks. In a 2014 restaurant feedback questionnaire, one franchisee wrote, We have 25 items on the dollar menu with breakfast and lunch. Why would a customer customer order anything else? Making the dollar menu popular was never a problem, but making it profitable has proven to be a challenge. In 2012, there were reports that they'd be changing the dollar menu. That same year, McDonald's net income fell from $1.51 billion to $1.46 billion. McDonald's tried persuading customers to order from its new, slightly more expensive extra value menu, but customers didn't respond well. The next year, McDonald's tweaked the dollar menu to become the dollar menu and more. Introducing the dollar menu and more, featuring all your classic hits and amazing new ones. This version bumped up the cost of a McChicken to $169. Ah, the old double cheeseburger for an eensy-weensy price trick. Well, that $1 double cheeseburger was suddenly the not-so-eensy-weensy price of $2.19. Market researchers felt the move was a mistake, arguing that a dollar menu should only include items for a dollar. Makes sense to us. So, you're here for the new McPick 2 menu? Indeed. In late 2015, McDonald's announced the McPick 2 menu, no doubt trying to capitalize on the success of their dollar menu glory days. This two-for-$2 two deal let customers choose from a McDouble, a McChicken, small fries, and mozzarella sticks. At the time, CEO Steve Easterbrook said the restaurant was lacking an equivalent form of value to the original dollar menu. But $2 just doesn't sound as appealing as $1, and McPick 2 didn't stand a McChance. The deal was all but dead before spring 2016, and McDonald's altered the menu to McPick two for five dollars. That's right, they went from two dollars to five dollars in just a few months, offering items like the filet fish and the quarter pounder burger, but there wasn't much to distinguish the newer McPick 2 from the normal menu. Same fast food, different day. If fast food history tells us anything, it's that the second you get comfortable, your competitors move in for the kill. After retiring the McPick 2 menu, McDonald's announced it was unveiling a new version of the dollar menu in late 2017. It would still feature items that cost a dollar, but there were also items for two and three dollars. Enjoy more favorites on the one, two, three dollar menu at McDonald's. Noticing McDonald's lack of a full-fledged, bona fide dollar menu, Taco Bell called them out on it by releasing their own not-new $1 menu press release, which pointed out that they'd been selling 20 items for $1 apiece for years. Touché, Taco Bell. Despite the fact that it wasn't exactly a full-fledged dollar menu, market analysts predicted a 2% boost in sales for McDonald's that would be felt by other chains, and it looks like those predictions were right on the money. In the first three months after the new menu was introduced, McDonald's U.S. sales jumped to 2.9%. Meanwhile, competing chains scrambled to offer their own value menus, with Taco Bell launching $1 nacho fries and Dunkin' Donuts unveiling their two-for-$2 two breakfast wrap. Touché, McDonald's. Sure, you've eaten at McDonald's plenty of times, but that doesn't mean you're doing it right. Here's a rundown of everything you need to know before you go there again. From money-saving tricks to dirty little secrets, the famous burger chain doesn't want you to know. You've no doubt heard about the hack to getting the freshest fries at McDonald's. Just ask for them with no salt. Once you've got your fresh fries, throw a bit of salt on them yourself and voila, you've beaten the system. Except you haven't. In fact, putting this so-called hack into practice is a waste of your time and everyone else's. It isn't even going to make your fries better, and it's actually a breach of fast food etiquette because it causes a holdup in the queue as staff scurry to make that fresh batch. Applying table salt to fries isn't the same as the restaurant's method of applying finer salt to them either. By throwing your own on there, you're just gonna waste a bunch of salt and make your fries taste weird. So why bother? And that's not all. Asking for this special order is a huge hassle for the cooks themselves, who have to to remove the fries currently under the heater, make sure the bin is free of salt, and start a whole new batch of fries, all because you wanted to try out that funny little hack you found online. Just don't do it, okay? Here's one for anyone fond of McDonald's breakfasts. 
you might already be aware of the existence of the classic McDonald's egg. That's the one that comes up in things like their breakfast sandwiches and tends to be a weird, square and yellow thing that looks more like cheese than anything else. In fact, it's a scrambled egg concoction that is pressed into a square patty. Luckily, however, it's not your only choice of egg on the menu. If you'd rather have the egg more commonly associated with the Egg McMuffin, all you have to do is tell your cashier that you'd like your sandwich made with a round egg. They'll make sure your order contains the poached version, and it'll cost you nothing extra. You could probably host a whole debate over which McDonald's egg is superior, but this is a great little tip for anyone who prefers theirs round and just a little more natural looking. Of course, you don't need a receipt for your McDonald's order, but you should always ask for one. The reasoning behind this is simple. It's a way of signaling to the staff that you could be a secret shopper, even if you're not, because secret shoppers have to be reimbursed for their meal by their employers. They need receipts to prove what they've eaten. Most customers, however, won't need a receipt and therefore won't ask for one. If you do make that request, however, the store will be all hands on deck to make sure you get the freshest food, quickest service, and biggest smile just in case. Visiting during peak hours, specifically between 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. and 5 p.m. to 7 p.m., will up your chances of coming across as a potential secret shopper too, because those are the hours during which they usually appear. Play your cards right and you might just nab yourself a totally superior McDonald's experience. The self-order kiosks that McDonald's started installing in 2018 are a bit of nifty fast food tech. They're a great convenience for the customer, certainly, and they mean that diners don't have to spend time giving their orders to cashiers, while the cashiers can focus on getting the orders served up. There's just one little problem. Hygiene. Scientists discover that the McDonald's kiosks tend to be covered in bacteria, including fecal and other digestive bacteria. Dr. Paul Matwelli of London Metropolitan University explained it this way. We were all surprised how much gut and fecal bacteria there was on the touchscreen machines. These cause the kind of infections that people pick up in hospitals. For instance, Enterococcus faecalis is part of the flora of gastrointestinal tracts of healthy humans and other mammals. Dr. Matawelli's research took place on restaurants in the UK and found that touchscreens in every single one of eight different restaurants hosted live bacteria. McDonald's responded by issuing a statement, Our self-order screens are cleaned frequently throughout the day. All of our restaurants also provide facilities for customers to wash their hands before eating. How do you feel about that snazzy new technology now? You can't handle the truth! Since the McDonald's experience tends to be more about the food than anything else, you'd be forgiven for overlooking some of their more helpful tech. After all, why bother going through the trouble of downloading an app when you just want to get your hands on the burger? Don't write off the shiny stuff too quick, though, because the McDonald's app is a veritable treasure trove for regular McDonald's goers. The gist is simple. You download the app onto your phone and use it to choose meals or menu items, then you pay using your card, all before going to pick up your food at a nearby store. That last part happens entirely on your own terms, too, so you can use the app to specify that you want your food brought outside to you, collected at the drive-thru, or just served up inside the restaurant, all without having to worry about the line. Then you've got the deals. These are exclusive to the app and change all the time, so it's always worth checking out what's going on. You'll nab some free stuff, discounts, and all kinds of buy some, get some free offers. The poor man's Big Mac is another one of those classic McDonald's hacks you might have heard about. Here's a rundown. You order a McDouble and ask for it without mustard or ketchup, but with shredded lettuce and Big Mac sauce. What you end up with is essentially a Big Mac, minus the center bread and sesame seed bun, for about half the price. But is it really worth it? It might be, and here's why. The beef and cheese is identical to that found in the Big Mac, although the construction of the burger makes for a slightly different experience. Big Macs are made upside down, and the toppings are placed below the burger, while the McDouble has its toppings on top. And that means the McDouble's cheese is melted better than the Big Macs. By their measure, the toppings seem to be of equal quantity on both burgers, although the Big Mac is significantly taller and a little heavier. Essentially, however, it's just the bun and some seeds that make the Big Mac that much more expensive than the McDouble. The jury's out on which option is better, and much of it comes down to taste. But if you're working on a tight budget, the poor man's Big Mac might be your best bet. It's not a Big Mac. It's not. It's not. Well, I believe it is. Well, I believe it is. Uh, in January 2019, the internet practically exploded when a Twitter user discovered a great new use for the flap at the top of the fries boxes at McDonald's, storing ketchup. Yes, the idea appears that you can fold the flap back on itself 
creating a neat little shelf upon which your ketchup or alternative condiment can be stored. Naturally, people went wild at the discovery. Options ranged from amazed to skeptical to not impressed in the least. It's probably safe to say that this sauce shelf is an unintended bonus of a box which is designed to allow workers to grab the top without burning their fingers on hot, oil-covered fries. So, while it might not be intentional, that doesn't mean it's not a good idea. Have you ever been tempted to stop by a McDonald's in the middle of the night? Well, you're not the only one. The existence of 24-hour McDonald's branches means time is no longer a factor in determining when you can pick up a burger and some fries. And there's nothing stopping you from heading out on a 3 a.m. McNuggets run. Unfortunately, things aren't looking as good on that front as they used to be. In April 2019, McDonald's announced that they'd be removing a number of items from their late-night menu, including some of the restaurant's most iconic items, like chicken tenders and the filet of fish. In a statement given to Business Insider, who first leaked the news, a McDonald's rep explained it was simply a matter of streamlining. They said, We always want our customers' experiences to be simple, smooth, and delicious, any time of day. That means day and night, we're always looking for ways to serve them even better. Nothing quite beats the ingenuity of mankind. Just take this so-called McDonald's secret menu. It's not so much of an in-store secret offered by the chain as it is a series of different inventions and combinations crafted by some clever McDonald's customers. Some highlights include the Land, Sea and Air Burger, a combination of the Big Mac, filet fish and McChicken, all stacked together. Prefer a less boring breakfast? Try the Hash Brown McMuffin, which is a simple yet delicious combination of the McMuffin and a Hash Brown. How about the Chicken and McGriddles? That's when you put your order of crispy tenders right on your sausage, egg, and cheese McGriddles for an overwhelming breakfast sandwich. You could even try the McCrepe, which is a scoop of the fruit and yogurt parfait wrapped in a pancake. And when it comes to dessert, there's fun to be had there too. Ever dip your apple pie into a McFlurry? No? What are you waiting for? Some of these ideas are downright brilliant, others are utterly grotesque, and a few are kind of both. The one thing tying them all together is that they show the sky's the limit with McDonald's. All you need to do is ask. Some days you just can't help yourself and end up using fast food to test the limits of what your body can endure. Whether you're trying to avoid them or just curious if you can handle them, here are the least healthy things you could possibly order at McDonald's. Among the less bad options is the Big Breakfast, which clocks in at the very big indeed 750 calories. There's also the Double Quarter Pounder with cheese at 780 calories. Above those are the 20-piece McNuggets, which adds up to 890 calories. Who needs moderation? To wash it all down, there's the Large Chocolate Shake, which weighs in at 840 calories and 122 grams of sugar to boot. Beyond calories, it goes without saying that each of these choices come with downright frightening quantities of sodium and fat. In fact, some of these menu items contain more than half the amount of salt a human ought to consume over a whole day. McMuffins are cheap, tasty, and simpler than ever to come by, so it's easy to take these little breakfast buddies for granted. But the iconic McDonald's sandwich is anything but an ordinary pile of eggs, cheese, and Canadian bacon. Here's the fascinating truth of the McDonald's Egg McMuffin. The McMuffin was dreamed up by one Herb Peterson, a McDonald's franchise owner with three locations in Santa Barbara, California. A fan of Eggs Benedict, Peterson wanted to design a Benny-inspired sandwich that would give him an excuse to open his restaurant before lunchtime. Thus, in 1971, the pioneering restaurateur invented the Egg McMuffin, that tantalizing tower of toasted English muffin, egg, Canadian bacon, and melted American cheese. McDonald's president Ray Kroc was hesitant at first, but was sold after his first bite. It took six years to get the Egg McMuffin on menus of McDonald's nationwide. By 1976, however, Americans were hooked. Soon, McDonald's extended its hours and beefed up its breakfast menu with more AM-only treats. Following the success of the Egg McMuffin, McDonald's breakfast tactics were predictably imitated by competitors. In 1983, Burger King launched the Croissantwich, a breakfast sandwich built from a croissant, egg, and cheese with an optional choice of meat. Lagging far behind was Taco Bell, which introduced a breakfast menu with breakfast tacos, burritos, and the short-lived waffle taco in 2014. What is this? A waffle taco? What's next? A pancake enchilada? Slippery slope, I tell you. 
competitors like Wendy's, Sonic and Subway also rolled out their own breakfast menus, but for all their efforts, McDonald's continued to reign as the most popular fast food breakfast spot in the US. According to Foursquare, McDonald's ranks number one for breakfast in every state in the US except for Oklahoma, as of the making of this video. Oklahomans preferred Sonic for breakfast, but ranked McDonald's as a close second. For 13 consecutive months beginning in 2012, McDonald's saw sales fall or remain flat. Ronald McDonald got an eerie new makeover. The restaurant started making artisan chicken sandwiches, but they never really took off. Customers left and right were ditching hamburgers in favor of tacos. But when McDonald's unleashed its all-day breakfast and made the McMuffin accessible 24-7 in October 2015, everything changed. Following the extension of breakfast hours, sales rose by nearly 6%, the largest increase McDonald's had seen in nearly four years. Now, McDonald's breakfast counts for 25% of its US sales, and shareholders are in love. I love you. And I think you're the Egg McMuffin of boyfriends. The McMuffin's perfectly round egg patties may look suspicious, but there's a good reason for the shape. McMuffin inventor Herb Peterson commissioned a local blacksmith to create a stainless steel, teflon-coated six-ring tool to cook the egg into a circular patty that fit onto the muffin perfectly. To this day, McDonald's uses similar contraptions depending on the location. But because the Egg McMuffin's egg is a little too perfect, customers have speculated that they're fake or are made using an industrial-sized version of that egg tube machine from those late-night infomercials. Just crack, pour, and watch them pop up in no time. But McMuffins indeed come with fresh eggs, weighed to ensure they are the perfect size cooked on a normal griddle. In fact, the Egg McMuffin is the only item on the menu made from fresh eggs, making it a cut above the rest. It's the Egg McMuffin of automobiles. I'll take it. McDonald's gets a bad rap as being the quintessential purveyor of unhealthy American cuisine. To the company's credit, they're making major strides to provide healthier options these days. But long before ditching the artificial preservatives in McNuggets and soft serve and taking soda off the Happy Meal menu, McDonald's offered at least one kind of healthy food, the Egg McMuffin. Seriously, the Egg McMuffin is made with a real egg that is poached and not fried. The classic version of the sandwich has a small circle of Canadian bacon, a single slice of American cheese and real butter. Together, this all adds up to a reasonable 290 calories and 12 grams of fat. In terms of unhealthy breakfast options, you could definitely do a lot worse. Anyone who grew up in the 1970s and beyond probably remembers McDonald's colorful McDonaldland-themed advertisements. What you might not know is that McDonald's essentially stole the entire idea for their fantasy land. By the late 1960s, people realized that children were a perfect target for advertising, as their undeveloped brains could be easily manipulated for quick bucks. So in early 1970, McDonald's came up with the idea of using the popular characters from Sid and Marty Croft's hit TV series H.R. Puffin Stuff in order to sell fast food to kids. Phone calls were exchanged and the Crofts received an official letter saying the deal was going forward and that they would be paid for their work. However, later that year, the Crofts were abruptly told that the plan had been scrapped. Except, of course, it hadn't been. In 1971, McDonald's unveiled their wildly popular McDonaldland a fantasy realm filled with weird burger-themed creatures and puppets. The ad campaign was a massive success, leading to McDonaldland-themed playgrounds around the country and a surge in sales. One problem, though. The concepts and characters in McDonaldland were almost completely ripped off from H.R. Puffin stuff. Especially egregious was Mayor McCheese, whose design was almost identical to H.R. Puffin stuff's titular dragon other than having a fluffy bun for a head. Needless to say, the Croft sued, and that's when things really got interesting. As the lawsuit played out, the depth of McDonald's perfidy became apparent. Not only did McDonald's appropriate the basic concepts of the H.R. Puffin Stuff characters, they actually hired away the Croft employees who had designed and built the H.R. Puffin Stuff characters to begin with. In fact, McDonald's went so far as to even recruit the voice talent from H.R. Puffin Stuff to do the voices for the McDonaldland characters, too. The Croft's lawsuit wasn't just about the theft of intellectual property, though. Thanks to the massive McDonald's marketing machine, the McDonaldland characters quickly became so popular that they pushed H.R. Puffin Stuff out of the market. The Crofts lost a number of merchandising and licensing deals as companies turned to McDonald's instead. Case in point, the Ice Capades, which replaced the Puffin Stuff characters with the McDonaldland gang. 
Once the lawsuit went to court, one of the more unique aspects of the trial is the fact that it was more about how children perceive things than how adults did. The Crofts argued that while adults might know the difference, little kids being marketed to wouldn't understand that the McDonaldland gang wasn't actually part of their beloved Saturday morning HR Puff and Stuff show. So the usual legal burden of copyright infringement was superseded by something far less common in lawsuits — common sense. Even though McDonald's argued that they had changed enough small details to make their characters legally different, the courts didn't buy it. As the text from the case notes, "...we do not believe that the ordinary, reasonable person, let alone a child viewing these works, will even notice that Puffin Stuff is wearing a cummerbund while Mayor McCheese is wearing a diplomat sash." In 1977, six years after the battle started, the courts found McDonald's guilty. But did they really lose? In the end, McDonald's was forced to pay the Crofts more than $1 million in damages, including $6,000 per commercial, $5,000 for each promotional item made, and $500 for other infringing acts. They were also ordered to stop using certain characters and to stop airing commercials, running promotions, or selling items that featured those characters. Over the following years, the McDonald Lane characters began to fade in popularity, but by the time the lawsuit was finally completed in 1977, the goal had already been accomplished and the damage done. H.R. Puffin Stuff has been relegated to a footnote of history, mostly notable for sneaking references to hippie drug culture into kids' television. Jumpin' Jehassafat! We've been drugged! Characters like Grimace, The Hamburglar, and Mayor McCheese, on the other hand, are still part of America's cultural lexicon and help turn McDonald's into a worldwide phenomenon. Ha! Ah! Rubble, rubble! Les miserable rubble! And when you put it that way, one million dollars seems like a bargain. People love themselves some McDonald's Chicken McNuggets. But where exactly did the McNugget come from? How has it changed over the years? And what is it, really? It's time to answer some questions on these popular chicken bites and look at what's next for the nugget. Just as McDonald's was hitting its stride with burgers and on the way to becoming a global sensation, people started getting beef phobia. By the early 1960s, the American public became a little wary of beef because of the health conditions associated with it. Words like cholesterol, saturated fat, and heart disease were new buzzwords. Beef was the boogeyman. And understandably, this didn't sit well with McDonald's. But by the late 1970s, they had a new secret weapon, Chef René Arend a man who once had the privilege of cooking for the Queen of England. After Ray Kroc suggested shifting the focus to a new side item, a bite-sized onion nugget, chairman of the board Fred Turner pitched the idea of a chicken nugget. A rent got to work. Just five months later, in 1983, a McNugget prototype hit Tennessee locations and smashed all expectations. But why did this gourmet chef turn out something that's admittedly less than gourmet? He later confessed, "...we have to cater to the American public. I am 31 years here, nearly as long as McDonald's. I have also become Americanized." Chef René once described making the McNugget like this, "...in food, you invent nothing. You create." In my kitchen, I create the McNugget this way. I debone a breast and a thigh, a little salt, a little flour. But when you are cooking for the masses, it is different. Just how different has been an issue plaguing McDonald's for years. The infamous nauseating photo of purportedly pre-nugget pink slime swept through the internet in 2010. And McDonald's responded to the photo, saying, "...we do not use the process known as mechanically separated chicken, nor do our Chicken McNuggets ever at any point look like this photo." A press release isn't always convincing, though, especially coupled with a 2013 study that found many commercially sold chicken nuggets contained only about 50 percent meat. The rest? a hodgepodge of ground-up bone, blood vessels, nerve, and connective tissue. While the companies selling these questionable nuggets were not named, it's easy to see how this study might ruffle the feathers of McDonald's, who sprang into action with the Our Food, Your Questions campaign. Some customers were assured by the campaign, others were definitely not. Sales continued to drop in 2015. If you assumed that McNuggets were just plopped out of the McNugget machine in some random shape, you should know nothing is farther from the truth. Other chains might have random chicken nugget shapes, but the Golden Arches has four precise shapes of McNuggets. Those shapes even have special names to identify them — the ball, the boot, the bow tie, and the bell. According to McDonald's, the four shapes were chosen as the perfect equilibrium of dippability and fun. Three would have been too few, five would have been, like, wacky. Now you know. 
In 2012, 23 bidders competed to win a three-year-old Chicken McNugget because they believed it resembled George Washington. The only thing more stupefying than people trying to outbid each other for an old Chicken Nugget is that the winning bid was $8,100. Considering that McNuggets come in four distinct shapes, one that sorta looks like a fried George Washington is a little odd. The bidding started at a respectable $100, but after multiple news outlets picked up the story, bids began rolling in. The good news is that it was all for charity. The bad news? Ultimately, the winning bidder backed out of the deal. In 2014, world record-holding athlete Usain Bolt stopped by the Arsenio Hall show and shared a bit of his Olympic diet plan. Mostly chicken nuggets. <laughs> I know, it, it works. <laughs> During the 2008 Beijing Olympics, Bolt reportedly ate at least 1,000 Chicken McNuggets. Bolt, who was 22 at the time, hit up a McDonald's every chance he got, and later wrote in his memoir, Faster Than Lightning, At first, I ate a box of 20 for lunch, then another for dinner. The next day, I had two boxes for breakfast, one for lunch, and then another couple in the evening. The Jamaican gold medalist estimated that over the course of 10 days, he ate at least 100 McNuggets a day. That's around 47,500 calories worth of McNuggets total, in case you were wondering. McDonald's has some serious competition in the chicken game, and most comes from Chick-fil-A. Part of trying to stay ahead of the game includes their 2017 promise to stop serving poultry with antibiotics and remove artificial preservatives from McNuggets and other items. There's plenty of places making that commitment, but they also rolled out Southern-style chicken that looks very, very similar to their Chick-fil-A inspiration. Chick-fil-A claims that their nuggets are all hand-breaded at each store, so they could still have McDonald's beat in that department. Considering that people are eating more beef than chicken, it's probably wise for McDonald's to refocus on improving their McNuggets. What's next for these classic favorites? Only time will tell. Since the 1940s, McDonald's has enjoyed a mainstream popularity other fast food companies could only dream of having. For better or worse, McDonald's has immense power and influence around the world, thanks in large part to its marketing and advertising. Here are some of the tricks the chain uses. Human eyes are attracted to movement, and McDonald's puts this to good use in their marketing with animation. According to MarketWatch, McDonald's uses subtle animation to direct customers' attention away from the lower price value meal options and point them toward the pricier ones. This helps to tempt customers away from their old favorites like the classic double cheeseburger or filet fish and to try something new. These types of animations are so small you could easily miss them. Sometimes it's just a brief highlighting of a word or the spinning of a new menu item's title. You'll see these animations not only on the kiosks, but also on the digital displays and menus at the checkout. The reason it works is because our eyes are meant to track changes in color, speed, or shape. Additionally, by forcibly moving our eyes around the digital displays, McDonald's is also injecting a wider variety of menu options into our short-term memory. With more options to choose from, it's more likely customers will divert from their usual order for something different and more expensive. Oh, that looks good. Look at this beauty. It's probably safe to say that many people don't go to McDonald's to have a healthy meal, but as consumers become more knowledgeable about food sourcing and nutrition, McDonald's has had to battle the guilt that can come from eating fast food. According to Behavioral Economics, research has shown that simply including healthy options on a menu can actually encourage consumers to purchase more unhealthy items. Even an image of a simple salad or a bottle of water behind a McDonald's burger can give the overall impression of a healthier restaurant, which takes away guilt and encourages indulgence. Obviously, it's all just an illusion, as the food is not actually healthier and many of the meals don't come with salad or water, but the tactic still works. The curated menu board is an example of several different McDonald's advertising practices combined, but on a smaller scale. The menu board is not simply an innocent list of all the McDonald's items you'd expect, but rather a last-ditch effort by the company to influence your decision-making. Like on the kiosks, the menu boards will use subtle animation to draw the customer's eyes onto specific items, influencing the buyer to consider more items without them even realizing it. While a hamburger may not even take up a line on the menu, a new or expensive item may take up a quarter or more of the board and include a picture. The majority of the menu is therefore just advertising space. And this is why it's hard to find old classics and easier to find deals or new items that make you spend more overall. It's all about breaking customers out of their value menu habits. While McDonald's might be quick to highlight the prices of certain deals, you're unlikely to see the actual cost of most items on its promotional material. This is all a purposeful attempt to lessen the psychological pain of eating out and spending money. 
According to behavioral economics, consumers tend to care more about the money loss than the goods they get in exchange. So even if you purchase something you really wanted, your mind will apparently still be more focused on the money you had to pay for it. McDonald's advertising makes sure we only think of the joy of purchasing food, not the pain of spending money. That's why there is almost no mention of price on any of the photos. Any mention of spending money, however, is put in the context of how much money you're saving in exchange for the delicious goods you'll receive. It's no accident that the restaurant's most well-known set of items is the dollar menu, which they've brought back again and again. But I don't have money problems. McDonald's knows how to use competition to its advantage, and the dollar menu plays a role in this competition. McDonald's uses price anchoring to create emotional responses to different menu items. By pitting the dollar menu or cheaper, classic menu items against newer lines or limited edition items, McDonald's is able to manipulate our behavior. For example, McDonald's recently scaled back its dollar menu while simultaneously pushing its signature crafted items, which were unsurprisingly more expensive. The general feeling was that McDonald's was going to become more costly and, as a result, the traditional items appear cheaper. This apparently influenced people to not only buy more of the traditional items, but to opt for size upgrades or add-ons too. According to behavioral economics, McDonald's was shifting our entire perspective and, all the while, we thought we were getting a great deal. The day McDonald's kiosks unleashed their beautiful glow on the world was the day McDonald's endeared itself to a generation of people who grew up addicted to screens. Not only do they reduce social interaction anxiety, they also give the customers more control over their orders and allow them to make their decisions in their own time, without pressure from a cashier or other customers in line. In other words, McDonald's kiosks are designed to make the ordering and dining experience easy and pain-free. This even makes people more likely to come into the restaurant in the first place. And since customers don't feel judged by another human while ordering, they have less guilt. And this often makes people order more food or feel better about upgrades and add-ons. Humans love patterns and groups, especially when they come in threes. McDonald's uses simple repetition like this to increase interest in its products. It's not uncommon to see their promotional images consist of three burgers in a row, three nearly identical sundaes in a row, or three milkshakes in a row, which is apparently much more attractive to the human brain. For example, back when McDonald's was heavily promoting its signature collection, it had three very similar-looking burgers of the same type that were often showed together. These were the classic, the spicy, and the barbecue. And when they were re-promoting the Quarter Pounder in 2019, McDonald's presented it as one of three, being the Quarter Pounder Bacon, the Quarter Pounder Deluxe, and the Quarter Pounder with Cheese. Again, it's pretty much the same burger, just changed ever so slightly to make it a list of three, therefore making it more desirable to customers. In the past, there were fast food restaurants and dine-in restaurants. You were either in for a quick, cheap, and easy meal or a full-service, pricier sit-down experience. There wasn't really a place where you could pop in wearing sweatpants but still treat yourself to nice decor, high-quality food, and fast but friendly service. Cue the fast casual restaurant trend, where diners can have it all. These days, sit-down restaurants can relax a little and make use of an assembly line, while fast food joints can make their venues a little more classy. McDonald's jumped on this bandwagon, and McCafe was born. Additionally, McDonald's also began offering table service, where customers have the option to request that a McDonald's employee bring the order to their tables. In a creative move, McDonald's was able to revamp its reputation, appearing more customer-friendly and socially attentive. Instead of going the route of cutting costs and reducing staff, McDonald's reinvested in its service, and it seems to have paid off. Humans are impatient creatures, especially when it comes to food, and perhaps even more so when we've chosen to eat at a fast food establishment. McDonald's has always promised to feed us quicker than everyone else, and as technology improves, we continuously expect McDonald's to keep up. In a world of two-day delivery and instant streaming, waiting more than five minutes for a burger seems ridiculous. Therefore, McDonald's must convince us that we're barely waiting around for our food. One way they do this is by breaking up the lines. The way the human brain works, waiting in one line for 10 minutes feels longer and more irritating than waiting waiting in two different lines for five minutes each. According to behavioral economics, the variety in movement from one area to another gives the illusion of less time spent waiting overall. That's why McDonald's has not only two separate ordering areas from which to choose, it also has a separate section devoted solely to food pickup. Not only that, but breaking up the process actually makes it faster, since the server has fewer responsibilities to deal with at a time. Lastly, another trick McDonald's uses to reduce wait time irritation is to give out order numbers. Knowing exactly how long we have to wait actually makes us more patient. McDonald's has stayed up to date with mobile technology. Thanks to the McDonald's app, customers can order ahead of time then check in to pay before receiving their orders. As behavioral economics explained, breaking the order and collection moments makes for an overall faster feeling experience by removing the order moment from the in-store experience. 
The app also increases the sense of control consumers have over their dining experience. And for the many people who want to minimize in-person interaction, this is a great option. For those who are looking for less contact and more service, the curbside pickup, which is available through the app, adds a bit of luxury. The app also makes use of the drive through All you have to do is tell the speaker your special code and your food will be ready for you. In many ways, the app simply takes the many modern changes McDonald's has made to its service and integrates them into a format that consumers are most comfortable with. Again and again, McDonald's has proven that in times of stress or boredom, convenience is a major consideration in terms of food. Some McDonald's locations even offer delivery, which makes for the ultimate easy meal. And as you may already know, takeout can quickly grow from an occasional treat to a bi-weekly or even weekly habit. While you may have only ordered McDonald's on road trips in the past, McDonald's has since become more accessible than ever. You can simply order on the app and wait for your meal to arrive at your door. It's really no surprise that the release of the McDonald's app was one of the most successful modern changes McDonald's has made to increase sales. The use of mobile-only offers and coupons also helped to boost the app's popularity and led to an increase in business. One of the greatest tricks McDonald's uses on us is the lure of nostalgia. The legacy of McDonald's is in creating an emotional bond with its clients. Even from the fast food chain slogan, I'm loving it, it's clear that McDonald's has a way of pulling on our heartstrings. According to ProfitWorks, as early as 1967, the company spent as much as $2.3 million on advertising, something that was unprecedented for a fast food joint at the time. The invention of the family-friendly Happy Meal in the late 1970s was a wildly successful business venture and a cultural icon that has proved to have staying power. McDonald's doesn't just sell food, it sells memories. Or at least that's what McDonald's tricks you into believing. Customers have found a couple ways to pull one over on McDonald's, too. Although McDonald's is already very affordable, many of its popular sandwiches and burgers can actually be created with add-ons and sides at cheaper costs. The most commonly mentioned example is the Sausage Egg McMuffin. By ordering a sausage muffin with an added egg, you could theoretically save yourself around a dollar. There's also the option to order a muffin with egg and cheese rather than the official Egg McMuffin. Eat This, Not That reported that, if you really wanted, you could even add a side of sausage to make a bootleg Sausage Egg McMuffin and save some money at the same time. There's also the option of ordering a Happy Meal, then upgrading it to an adult size to save a few bucks. Overall, though, it might not be worth the trouble and awkwardness. As a consumer, those couple dollars are well worth the simplicity and time saved. But to McDonald's, those extra bucks add up to a whole lot of breakfast bacon. Joey doesn't share food! <laughs> McDonald's announced it was phasing out its supersized fries and drinks back in 2004, but the concept of supersizing is so firmly associated with McDonald's and American fast food culture that people still use the term more than a decade later. So why did the supersized menu disappear, anyway? The reason McDonald's officially gave for making the decision to get rid of supersizing isn't what you might expect. Walt Riker, a spokesman for McDonald's, explained the move in a brief statement back in 2004, saying, The driving force here was menu simplification. That's a surprising rationale considering analysts have long considered the McDonald's menu to be too big to keep costs down and the speed of service up, and removing supersizing arguably did little to address those concerns. According to Bloomberg, in fact, McDonald's had 145 menu items in 2013, which is 85 more than they had in 2007, just three years after supersizing disappeared. If anything, the menu's gotten more complicated post-supersizing, so there's more to the story than just a desire to keep the menu simple. CBS News noted that the decision to get rid of supersizing back in 2004 went hand-in-hand hand with increasing pressure at the time being put on fast food restaurants to offer healthier alternatives. Awareness of the dangers of fast food was perhaps at an all-time high, with several high-profile lawsuits at the time against McDonald's and other chains for allegedly not being clear enough that what they were serving was unhealthy. Nothing really came of these lawsuits, but they raised the profile of fast food's damaging effects as well as the pressure on the major franchises to do something to help reverse those effects. So, it's likely that pressure had at least something to do with McDonald's nixing supersized options, whether the burger giant wanted to admit it or not. But McDonald's was in a bit of a bind at the time since it had claimed in the past that the option to supersize fries and drinks had nothing to do with increasing obesity rates. So crediting those rates or just wanting to provide healthier options for getting rid of all things supersized would have contradicted the iconic eatery's past statements. Behind the scenes, in fact, the move to remove supersizing was done under the umbrella of McDonald's Eat Smart, Be Active initiative, which was launched in 2003. The campaign was geared toward not just making McDonald's healthier, but giving stagnant sales a much needed boost. At the same time supersizing disappeared, McDonald's also traded in 2% milk for 1%, added entree salads, and tweaked portion sizes across the board. 
But how popular was this upsizing option anyway? If you always said yes to supersizing, it turns out you were actually in the minority. Spokesperson Walt Riker listed this as another reason for removing the option from menus back in 2004, saying, The fact of the matter is not many supersized fries are sold. That may come as a surprise to those of us who remember the supersized menu with fondness, but it's true. The actual numbers are even more shocking. According to the BBC, supersize options accounted for just 0.1% of McDonald's total sales at the time it was phased out. When America's favorite mustachioed documentarian Morgan Spurlock named his 2004 expose on the physical consequences of the fast food industry Super Size Me, it forever linked McDonald's trademark option with weight gain and a whole slew of health issues. I think I'm gonna have to go supersize. But spokesperson Walt Riker, as you'd expect, said that the film had nothing to do with the disappearance of supersizing. McDonald's official line on the film was that it wasn't actually a film about their food. It was about Spurlock making the incredibly bad choice to eat 5,000 calories a day, which is a fair enough point. But the success of Super Size Me certainly added negative connotations to the supersizing concept, likely influencing McDonald's decision to not resurrect it in the years since. Here's the super weird thing. Supersizing is no more, but when you actually compare current sizes to what you got when you supersized something, there's actually not too much of a difference. The difference between a large and a supersized Coke was only a relatively small 97 calories in 2004. When it comes to the fries, you were only getting 74 more calories and about 3 more grams of fat in the supersized version. CBS News adds that a supersized carton of fries held 7 ounces, and the large that stayed on the menu was a 6-ounce container. Bottom line, it's easy as ever to indulge on Mickey D's if you really want to, whether it's called supersizing or not. So don't waste your time mourning the loss of the chain's more indulgent days. Supersizing is still alive and well, if only in spirit. The Big Mac is the world's most famous hamburger, but it'd probably be fair to assume that many people don't know all that much about the Big Mac's life story. Here are a few of the more obscure facts about McDonald's flagship meal. McDonald's iconic Big Mac was created in 1967 by the late Jim Delegatti, a McDonald's franchisee. This is my dad, Jim Delegatti. This is my dad, Jim Delegatti. He created the world's greatest burger. It was intended to be a rival to Burger King's signature sandwich, the Whopper. I'm going to show you how McDonald's builds a, a Big Mac sandwich. Delegatti is the man who cooked up the double-decker design and perfected the now legendary special sauce. After introducing the Big Mac to his franchise, profits soared, and the burger went nationwide a year later. Of course, it was the McDonald's Corporation who made the really big bucks off Deli Gaddy's creation. Meanwhile, guess what he received for his contribution? He gave me a plaque. That's it. That's it. Back in 2017, for one day only, a Boston McDonald's unveiled an ATM machine that doled out fresh Big Macs instead of bills. Hundreds of people lined up, pumped up, outside McDonald's in Kenmore Square today for the novelty of getting a free, fresh Big Mac from an ATM. Perhaps not surprisingly, customers seem to really love the idea. I skipped class for this, so I really hope it's worth it. But uh, it looks like it's worth it. I opened it and like... It looks really nice. I'm just waiting. Like, I'm probably going to skip to my next class for this too. <laughs> Sadly, the Big Mac ATM was a one-off gimmick. So don't expect McDonald's to be installing them at your local gas station anytime soon. Located in North Huntington, Pennsylvania, the Big Mac Museum restaurant offers guests the chance to walk through the history of their legendary burger. According to a McDonald's press release, highlights include the world's tallest Big Mac statue, loads of historic memorabilia, and more. If you're lucky, you can also sit down at the restaurant's special Big Mac booth next to a bust of Jim Deli Gaddy. And if you yearn to mingle with fellow Big Macs fanatics in a safe, non-judgmental environment, this is the place. What's the best thing about the Big Mac? Special sauce. You know what? I'm going to have to say the special sauce is the best part. In 2018, the Big Mac celebrated its 50th anniversary by introducing the Mac Coin, a commemorative coin given out to customers who purchased a Big Mac at any one of the 1,400 participating locations. McDonald's unveiled limited edition global currency to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Big Mac. The Mac Coin can also be used to purchase another Big Mac. The coins were minted in seven different languages. You can even take your coin to another country and use it to get a free Big Mac there. Love Big Macs as much as this guy? Then you probably want some Mac coins of your own. Lucky for you, people are selling off their collections on eBay at extortionist prices. Meet Don Gorski. This is his house. This is his passion. In 2018, Gorski made history by eating his 30,000th Big Mac. 
In fact, he claims the burger represents between 90 and 95 percent of his overall food intake. My dad would take me to McDonald's as a kid. I remember one time I told him I was going to eat there every day sometime, and that really did happen. Since 1972, Gorski has gone only eight days without eating a Big Mac. Once, when his local Mickey D's was shut down during a snowstorm, and on the day his mother died. Shortly before eating his 30,000th Big Mac, Gorski gave a brief presentation to a small crowd of admirers. <laughs> but he'd better watch his back. A salesman named Dennis Rosenlob is gaining fast. Mondays, I always eat one Big Mac, two on Tuesdays, one on Wednesdays, two on Thursdays, one or two on Friday, and two every Saturday. Ten a week. The Big Mac has a few famous fans, including Donald Trump. When you roll up at a McDonald's, what is what do you Donald Trump order? That uh, fish delight sometimes. Right? <laughs> uh, the uh, the Big Macs are great. According to Michael Wolff's Tell All Fire and Fury, Trump enjoys spending his evenings sitting in bed eating Big Macs and watching television. In 2016, Trump told Jimmy Fallon that he trusts fast food chains more than other restaurants. At least you know what you're getting. I don't want to go into a restaurant and say, Mr. Trump would like a hamburger to go. Yeah. Now, I don't know what they're going to do to that hamburger. Also worth noting, when it comes to McDonald's and Donald Trump, it seems like they go way back. How do you do it? What's your secret? The filet -O fish from McDonald's has been around longer than the Big Mac and is one of the biggest non-burger success stories of the franchise. Although it has held its own on the McDonald's menu for over 50 years, there are still a lot of things about the filet -O fish that you probably don't know. The filet -O fish was McDonald's first non-meat sandwich addition to the menu, and while it has remained a popular menu item for over 50 years, it was created out of necessity by one desperate franchisee. The groundbreaking idea to add a mouth-watering fried fish sandwich to the menu of a burger joint was first introduced by a Cincinnati-area franchisee in 1961. His Ohio restaurant was located in an area of the city where over two-thirds of the population were practicing Catholics and didn't eat meat on Fridays. As a result, the burger sales dropped dramatically on Friday nights. He realized he was losing most of his Friday business to another area franchise that had a fish sandwich on the menu. He knew that he needed to act fast to be competitive and save his profit margin. And just like that, the filet -O fish was born. If you were wondering about just what you're eating when you bite into your filet -O fish, you're not alone, but you can breathe easy. The filet -O fish is a is an evil cancer square created <laughs> to destroy America. You may be quick to assume the fast food filet is a mishmash of questionable non-fish ingredients, but there's nothing artificial happening here. The first filet of fish sandwiches were made with halibut until McDonald's started using cod shortly after, in an effort to save money. These days, the filet of fish is made with sustainable Alaskan pollock. The one thing you can't deny about the filet of fish is its delightful aroma. What's the problem? It smells like fish in here. And it is a very delicious bun to go along with it. A major detail that sets it apart from its beef-based counterparts at McDonald's is that unlike the other sandwiches on the menu, the fish sandwich is served on a bun that is steamed, which makes the bread lighter and fluffier than the toasted buns used for most of the other classic sandwiches like the Big Mac. Even if you don't mind the fact that McDonald's uses pasteurized processed American cheese on the filet -O fish you still may have wondered why they only give you a half slice. Surely the corporate giant that is McDonald's can afford to give you a whole piece, right? But the folks at the Golden Arches aren't doing it just to be cheap. In fact, the McDonald's executives were afraid that adding too much cheese would overpower the fish patty. A half slice of cheese, according to them, was just enough to allow customers to enjoy the delicious flavor of the fish itself. President Donald Trump opened up about his love for fast food on the campaign trail during the 2016 election. At a town hall meeting in South Carolina, he told CNN's Anderson Cooper that his favorite menu item at McDonald's is the fish sandwich, which he called the quote, fish delight. In January 2019, President Trump shared his love for the fast food dish with the Clemson University football team, who visited the White House after winning the national championship. And I think we're going to serve McDonald's, Wendy's, and Burger King's with some pizza. Trump personally paid for a lavish fast food spread, which included a huge mound of filet fish sandwiches. filet fish lovers know there's nothing like that first bite into that hot, flaky fish yumminess. But no matter how delicious it is, odds are your filet fish sandwich is pretty old. McDonald's employees weighed in on a popular Reddit post warning customers that because most customers order burgers, the filet fish sandwiches tend to sit out longer than others. And if that information alone doesn't gross you out and make you just want to eat a homemade grilled cheese, some workers claimed in that same thread that the steamers that are used to warm your bun aren't exactly cleaned as often as they should be. Yum!
There's no way to make sure that you get a perfect filet of fish every time you visit a McDonald's. There's always a chance that you'll get too much tartar sauce or cheese that isn't perfectly centered inside of the bun. But if you're worried about getting stuck with a sandwich that's been sitting under a warmer for hours, there's a simple hack you can use to try to get something more fresh. The next time you order, try telling them to hold the cheese in order to increase your odds of ending up with a fish sandwich that's not that old. If you don't mind being perceived as a little high maintenance, this simple request will force the employees to prepare your filet of fish on the spot. This will make sure that your sandwich is fresh, or at least fresher than the rest. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more mashed videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.